Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I'm Taylor Rockwell. Daryl Grope is not with me today as he's currently southbound somewhere on Interstate 95. Only he knows where. Well, he and his wife. Uh, People being in cars is sort of going to be the theme of this episode as instead of Daryl, I've caught up ESPN's Julie Stewart Binks who chats for a solid 30 minutes while navigating the hellscape that I assume is Los Angeles traffic. We talk about the start of her broadcasting career, the tricks of the trade when it comes to sideline reporting, and why she chose to move from Fox to ESPN. I did also quickly want to add that this episode is sponsored by Audible. You'll hear more about them later on in the show, but I did want to add that Daryl is headed to Florida because his wife is attending a conference co-founded by Dennis Lehane, the amazing author who wrote the book upon which basically every movie about Boston is based. You've got Mystic River, Gone Baby Gone, The Drop, even Shutter Island. Uh, Well, many of his books are available on Audible, so if you're looking for a good audiobook to get you through any impending road trips you might be taking, uh, I'd say give them a listen. Now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Julie Stewart-Binks. Joining me on the line, we've got uh, Julie Stewart-Binks, formerly of Fox, now reporter for ESPN and Fox Sports Live. So I guess still with Fox would be a, a fair description, Julie. I know you're, uh, you're driving maybe in traffic at some point, uh, hopefully not, but thank you for taking the time to uh, join us today. Of course, I'm so glad to be here. And yes, I, I actually just braved through some rain, which is, uh, oh, the humanity in L.A. rain. So that was the <laughs> highlight of this morning's drive to Anaheim. Well, we're recording out of Richmond, Virginia, where we didn't go into the office yesterday because the entire city is covered in ice. So, yes, I feel your pain with uh, with, with, <laughs> with a, a brief downfall. I'm sure it was difficult. Uh, I also wanted to mention, um, obviously, as, as with all interviews, you have to read the person's Wikipedia page, which I did. Uh, and I love that your states that you graduated with a, the quote is, a couple of undergraduate degrees. I feel like the sentence that comes <laughs> after that should be like, no big deal, whatever. Uh, so I did want to ask, so what did you study and then how did you get into broadcasting? I know, it's very pretentious. I love that. I, I mean, I think Wikipedia is so strange where I have no idea who this person is that created this and has also said I was born Julie Stewart, which is not true. I was born Julie Stewart Banks. My parents put their last names together. Not many people know that. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, I, I went to Queen's University in Canada and I did uh, a double degree uh, undergraduate. I did in... Um, physical and health education, so gym and <laughs> drama. So I picked the two best subjects in high school and thought, hey, let's let's see where this goes. And at the time, I thought I wanted to do sports psychology, and I was really into that and kind of coaching that side. And then I um, – honestly, it was sort of by random chance. My mom was a news reporter for CBC in Canada. Not so much when I was older, but she just said, you know, honey, you should go – volunteer for the radio station at your university. I'll really enjoy it. I loved it there. And so I went to the radio station. They're like, we don't want any more volunteers. We're full. So then I'm like, well, I'll go to the TV station and, and see what that's like. So I went there. They're like, yeah, come on in. Uh, you know, you're, you'll do an interview tomorrow on a coffee house and all this stuff. I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll just like see how this goes. And then I remember after that first interview I did, I'm like, wow. I absolutely love the feeling I'm getting from being live and, like, talking to people and, uh, you know, that adrenaline rush you get when you play sports. Mm-hmm. But then I didn't want to be interviewing, like, people in coffee houses. I'm like, I want to do sports-related stuff. So then I geared everything towards really doing as many sports, uh, covering them in university as possible. And I was pretty awkward back in the day, not going to lie. I haven't really changed much now, but... I had to get a lot of repetition to to feel comfortable and to look comfortable on TV. And I think a lot of young people in the industry don't realize how much not only do you really have to just keep doing it over and over and over again for it to become natural, but you need to pay your dues and you need to kind of go to small towns, go work at volunteer stations, and you don't want to be making your mistakes on a national network. So if you can kind of iron out the kinks there, that's... Um, that's really what I did. So you say you, you had to find your footing. I, I'm curious, is there a video out there that's equivalent to the Boom Goes the Dynamite guy of you like struggling through your first uh, kind of live play-by-play or your, uh, your first live uh, studio appearance? I would say not live because to get to even just getting the, the live interview opportunity, you have to have kind of messed up a lot or you, you've had to kind of go through the trenches before them. But I do have a great interview. Uh, I don't think it would be easy to find, but just like I was actually interviewing the Queen 
where I went to school at women's soccer team and I was just like I was just so awkward like I kicked a ball at the end of the interview so I thought that would be like cool you know like signing off and run up to the goal and like kick the ball in the net <laughs> and, and just like it, it, it's one definitely I would never show anyone but you know it was just uh I was just pretty awkward <laughs> that's all but that's like that's normal and that's what yeah. I tell like young kids you know when you, you're struggling and you're like how am I ever going to make it? And I want to make it right now. It's like, you know what? It's going to take a while and that's okay. And you, you don't want to just jump into it and be amazing. And some people really are, have that like natural instantly the first time they pick up a microphone, they're great, but that's, that's not a lot of people and it's okay. And it's like, you need to be able to have to earn it. I think that that's huge. And that's what I tell a lot of people. Yeah, I can vouch for that. Obviously, not to the degree that, to the degree that you could uh, vouch for it, but I can say when we first started doing the show, we'd have moments where we we pre-record and uh, we'd like get through a segment, and Daryl would be like, "What? What were you talking about there?" It's like I have no idea. I blacked out. I was just I was just rambling. So yeah, I, I can vouch <laughs> yeah. for. Uh, doesn't always come naturally. Um, but you mentioned that you were interviewing the soccer team there. Were you always into soccer team? Because I know that you uh, for a period were focused on hockey. Uh, so how did you get into soccer, and how did you get back into covering soccer? Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing, I mean, when I was there at university, I did all different sports. So it was, you know, everything. Um, and growing up in Canada, hockey is by far number one. Uh, without a doubt, you know, you're born with skates on, everyone plays. It's the leading thing on the news and everything. But when, and I did some volunteer hockey stuff, because there was so much opportunity to kind of like get your feet wet in hockey. So then I did my master's in England at a small journalism school called City University. And when I was there, it was great. It was, I mean, it was a completely different sports culture. And I did a ton of soccer over there. And it wasn't like collegiate soccer. It was, they let me do Premier League stuff, um, you know, Champions League, all this, whatever, whatever I really wanted. And I got the intern at Sky Sports and Sky News. And that was that was so cool because soccer was everything there. And it was, you know, you like the fandom really just got me. I lived right near Emirates stadium and, you know, seeing the North London Derby and just like the amount of crowd, like drunken crowds and police everywhere. And like, you couldn't take the tube anywhere when if, like Chelsea's playing or Fulham and all these different things. And, and it was all encompassing and all consuming. And I, I was really lucky to be there and get to be like thrown right into it. And I, when I entered at Sky Sports, like I went to White Hart Lane, I went to Stanford Bridge for all the different press conferences. And I was super lucky. I had a, a mentor from the time and, um, and it was, it was great. The, the only problem I would say was do it with doing my degree in the, in England was, um, they really wanted me to change my accent to like get elocution lessons and get a British accent. And Sky Sports told me that because like I sat down with them and I'm like, hey, what do you guys think? Like, I know I'm still really young and I got a lot to, to work on, but do I have any potential? They're like, yeah, you do, but you're very American looking. I'm like, okay, well, I'm Canadian first of all, but um, they're like, you, you need to get a British accent if you want to be on TV here. So at that point, I was really happy they were honest with me because I, it would have been like, wait, am I British in my spare time? And then am I, like, am I British the rest of my life? <laughs> and, <laughs> and like, I'm not. And then whatever, it would have been strange. So then I just made the decision to go back to Canada. And I got, I, I actually ended up getting a job in hockey, ironically. But I always really liked soccer. And Fox Soccer Report, which was out based out of Winnipeg at the time, was always putting up job openings and whatever. So I applied. I did an audition. And um, I, I managed to get a job there, which was fantastic. My first, my first full-time job was in soccer and getting to work with, I don't know how much you ever watched that show, but like Michelle Lissell, Derek Taylor, Jeremy St. Louis, these guys are like in, institutions in soccer and for box soccer in, um, in, you know, in Canada and just throughout history. So uh, it was tough to get an opportunity there though, because these people were so good. So I was sort of just behind the scenes and then, um, not to bore you, but I ended up going to a smaller town after that, just to get more experience. Again, the repetition, the uh, um, just comfortability on TV, on the anchor desk, shooting, reporting, all that, and then 
ironically, ended up back working at Fox Sports with uh, going to L.A. There you go. So I feel like you said Tube properly. You said Darby properly. I feel like that should have been enough for Sky, but obviously it wasn't. Uh, so <laughs> my, my question then is when you transitioned back into Canada and covering American sports as well, were there similar like uh, constraints or were there similar concerns? Did you have to learn how to say something this way and not say it this way? Because I imagine there are like weird cadences in everyone's speech that maybe you have to work on and, and uh, develop. Oh, like in terms of my accent? Yeah, like, or, or just accent? even like I, oh. I feel like from doing voiceover work, I've learned that like things that I think I say correctly, I, I say incorrectly and we- weird mispronunciations and things like that. Were there any sort of, again, like limitations or requests made of you or was it all sort of like, nah, you're good, do what you want? No, oh, I mean, I think the biggest surprise was coming to the state from when I was in Canada and, and you grew up in Canada thinking like, as everyone does in North America, like I don't have an accent, nobody has an yeah. accent. American people have a twang. Us Canadians just speak normally. Whereas when I came down <laughs> here, I'm like, oh, wow. Holy smokes. I go back to Canada and think, wow, Canadians really do have a very distinct accent and how they pronounce the O sound and the A sounds and all this. So I, I kind of learned by trial by error with uh, the guys in Fox. They would, you know, they'd hear me say a word on TV or something. They're like, whoa, what did you just say right there? And I was saying process progress, um, story, you know, all these, like, scene, all these things that were actually, you didn't really realize were a difference, at least I didn't, when I was in Canada. So then I had to slowly write into the teleprompter how to say these things in USA talk. And then, of course, <laughs> now, oh, and, and, like, we would say in Canada, organization, like, organize, and it's obviously, like, organization. Yeah. Just, even these little intricacies, and so... I've certainly worked them into my vocabulary. But then whenever I go back to Canada, you sort of adapt to where you are or else yeah. you sound sort of weird, right? Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I didn't realize I had like any Southern to me until we were in New York and I said y'all and got like eight different looks. I was like, oh, right, that's that's not a thing that happens everywhere. So no, I'm with you on that. Um, I, I, I'm also with you because... Uh, Daryl and I, not to the extent again, but Daryl and I have done some uh, commentary live play-by-play here in Richmond for the local Richmond team. Uh, and one thing that we kind of always struggle with is when the producer's in your ear and like you're trying to do play-by-play, you're trying to interview somebody, the producer's giving you notes. I feel like when we do it, you can sort of always hear like a half-second pause when we're like, oh, right, there's a person there talking. How, how did you get used to that? Is that just something that comes with, uh, with time or are you, do you still kind of struggle with like, oh, there's a person talking right in my ear? Well, there's definitely times I find it uh, um, it's still still working with how to fully listen to what they're saying while you're also trying to, for me, me you know, yeah. uh, listen to the interviewee. And I find the hardest is when they're talking to me about something right when I'm either about to ask another question or they want me to wrap it up. So sometimes if it ever looks like I'm suffering a slight brain aneurysm, it's like, <laughs> I'm about to ask another question, and then at that last second, they're like, thank you. Oh, my dogs love to uh, get involved in the interviews. It's always really helpful. They really don't trust the mail carrier here in Richmond. Uh, Yeah, sorry, sorry, please continue. Oh, that's okay. I know, but you, the hard part is sometimes you don't hear them because you're either listening or it just, you're talking, and and, and so I I feel bad sometimes when that happens when they're trying to tell me, like, wrap it up right now, Mm -hmm. or, you know, they want something else, they a specific thing that they're telling me right at that moment they would want me to ask the guy and I'm like I'm sorry I I like I can't hear you you know so I'm just doing my own thing whatever so you know they try to get in your ear and give you some directions and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't it's just sort of you know it's live tv right that's another one I had for you was about just how challenging it is to be a sideline reporter, because I think people might, you know, see it as like, oh, you ask the coach a question, they throw to you for a quick segment on like what the current field conditions are like or something, and then you throw back. But in, in reality, I'm assuming you've got to like stay in touch with your producers, you've got to monitor what's actually happening in the game, but also kind of pay attention to the coaches to hear what they're saying, to hear the instructions they're giving, then deal with the field conditions and the temperature and everything else, and kind of be able to grab interviews on the fly. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot more to it. So just how challenging is it, and how long did it take you to kind of learn the ropes? Well, you uh, you have to be really uh, flexible and open to being able to adapt because with live TV and, and anything, it's never going to go how you think it's going to go. And 
things happen all the time that you have to be so aware of. And what I've learned over the two years of doing MLS sideline, and it has been, I look at from the first game that I ever did to MLS Cup, like it's been such a huge uh, difference in, in how I do it and, and what I'm good at and what still needs work. But it's uh, you, you are the reason why you're down there is to show people a completely different vantage point that that they can't have, that no one else has, that, to show them what they can't see and can't hear. So at the beginning, I used to have maybe some little nuggets on guys prepared or if they did something well. And I still do that every now and again, just in case, but it's always being able to just like have a head, have your head on the swivel. And I remember um, shadowing an NFL sideline reporter, Jen Hale, and she said, sidelining reporting is you keep an eye on the game, but you watch the sideline. So when I'm down there, like I'm, you know, say for MLS cup, like I'm back and forth between Brian Schmetzer and Greg Vanny and listening in, but also, you know, being cognizant that I can't do two reports in a row on Toronto FC or, mm. you know, people will be like, oh, she's so for Toronto or something. Like, you have to be so aware of everything. And then um, it, you're trying to listen in so intently, like, okay, uh, I, you know, I'm listening to Schmetzer. I know I'm already ahead of time what he wants. So knowing that, that's what I you always ask the coaches, like, you know, what are three things you want to see from your team today that you can kind of like, they're boxes that you can pick. And then you see Schmetzer like completely changing the formation and wanting like a random high press or change whatever, like the wingers on either side. And you have to be able to very quickly adapt to that, like, um, and, and notice it. And that comes with understanding a team's tactics and formation and, and really being able to almost like read lips too at the same time. Um, and I love that kind of stuff because it's so on the fly and it's so, like, you can't prepare for that. You have no idea what's going to happen down there. And then just having a relationship I built with every team. I have an assistant coach that I, uh, when a substitution happens or even when like an injury happens, anything, I go over to them and they'll tell me what's going on, but being able to then turn that information around as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. And then in the shortest amount of time, tell people it because, John Strong and I, the past two years, we developed a really good relationship in that I got to be able to say something as quick as possible because obviously there's no real stoppage in play. And if the ball ever got in your box, I stop talking. Yeah. And she just jumps in instantly. And then the producer will say, okay, Julie, finish your story if you have anything more to add. And he would then come down. But like the cardinal sin is like you cannot talk over a goal and i've seen it happen and it's happened to people before if it's you know it can be super random you know it can just come from anywhere but that you have to be again as you said you watch the game so intently and sometimes if you listen i'll say something and it'll be literally like one sentence and you try to pack in the information to that so that you don't disrupt the flow of the game and that can be like a, a sprint so it's thrilling i absolutely love sideline reporting for mls and as you mentioned i i still cover hockey and i i always tell everyone like i enjoy playing hockey a lot because i'm i'm well, grew up with it so i'm driving <laughs> i'm like oh no a guy almost hit me <laughs> um i uh i grew up with it and i love it but i love sideline reporting for mls it's um it's so exhilarating it's that the players are extremely respectful, professional. Everyone is such a pleasure to be around. And, you know, you just never know what's going to happen. And that's what I tell people. Like, you can't be too regimented and, like, this is what I'm going to ask Kayla Porter at halftime mm-hmm. because then something could instantly happen right before your interview, which happened this year. Brad Evans and him were fighting with one another. So my first question is, what are you guys talking about? Like, what's going on? Rather than something about the first half because you have to you have to ask the tough questions like you have to remember we're not there to be pr for the team Mm -hmm. but you do have to know when to push and when not to but you ask the questions that people want to know and you try to do that the best you can and and how often how often does that end in sort of the uh, the death stare? Because we've seen that recently with like Pep Guardiola, uh, Jurgen Klopp, kind of getting frustrated with the media. I'm sure you've ex- experienced that as well. When you ask a question, you kind of get like the the curt one or two word reply, or just the kind of three second silence with like a stare at you. Do you have a go to method for that, or you just kind of push through? Because I feel like I would go for joke, yeah, and I feel like that wouldn't work. Yeah, you just have to be like so quick on your feet to then go to the next thing. Like with that, 
she was just like, oh, that was nothing. I'm like, okay, then. And I just went right into the next question because gotcha. people are obviously cognizant of the fact that that is an awkward moment. So you just have to eliminate as best you can sort of the awkwardness that could be there. And it doesn't have, I mean, you can't play, you have no idea how people are going to react. So it's, uh, again, it's just being quick on your feet. And, and that takes time and that doesn't come overnight. And again, if I look back to my first MLS game, it would have been much more different than MLS Cup. So, yeah. uh, but the league is very helpful. Like they want the league to grow and they want, you know, I tell them how some of our viewers don't understand sometimes what's going on in terms of why certain players are being brought on or why a formation is being changed. So if we can kind of help a general audience understand that, then you kind of can create more fans that will tune in every week. So, yeah. So you, you say that you have no idea how people are, are going to react when it's on live TV. Are there players or coaches, though, that you know are going to give you something interesting, something decent, a good soundbite? And are there others who you know are going to be, let's say, challenging? Definitely. Like, we are, because you cover the team so much, you know who's a good talker, who's not. And the hardest part is this one isn't, and, you know, they score uh, a brace or the game-winning goal, and you're sort of like, well, they're, you know, and they're man of the match and not a great talker. You just got to push through it. And it's hard sometimes with the language barrier as well because you have to have it in English on an English-speaking TV oh, yeah. channel. But, um, yeah, we definitely – that just comes with understanding the guys. We know who's going to give us a good sound bite and who isn't. And you can tell who some of those players might be, especially the veteran guys. And I mentioned Brad Evans again, and he was he's always such a great interview. Um, and, and he's honest, and he'll give you a good bite. And – yeah, you know, a Will Johnson, um, you know, just some of the guys that have been there forever that can can be eloquent and, and provide insight. And as we know in sports, that's very difficult to get with different athletes. But I think soccer, ironically, maybe not in Europe and elsewhere, but in the U.S., I think there's an opportunity that these guys see that, you know, we're trying to build a sport, but they also have a chance to build their brand, too. So it works both ways. Do you think, with that in mind, building the brand, do you think one of the biggest things holding Major League Soccer back is that they don't have a song like Hockey Night in Canada? Yeah, I think that would help. Like, I mean, they're trying to do that with sort of the Soccer Sunday with ESPN and Fox. Oh, I was kidding. I didn't realize it was actually a thing. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like it's going well, though. No, um, that's, yeah, that's the, like, double header type thing with both networks doing it. And I think it's good that both networks do it because they're both trying to compete against one another to be better. So then the product is always continuously being pushed to a next level. Mm. But I think the biggest thing with MLS and um, it, it always goes back to the U.S. men's national team and the, the greater the U.S. and then while also incorporating players from MLS, like that, that only has a trickle down effect and we thought we see that with more with the U.S. women's national team and, and NWSL. I, obviously, that didn't really amount to as much as they sort of hoped, but I think 100% it would with MLS. It's already a very highly established league, and I think just, you know, if, if we can get something out of the U.S. going forward, we can get, you know, the quarterfinals sort of level, even around at 16, the greater – you're trying to get like people who like soccer will watch these games, but mm -hmm. it's getting people that are interested in soccer and USA at world cup to watch a league match, you know? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned so, the, both networks being involved. Um, obviously you've experienced with Fox and now you're with ESPN. So I'm curious what went into that decision. Why did you choose to leave Fox? Because for people on the outside, I mean, at this point, Fox, Fox has lots of MLS. They have USMNT and women's national team games, as do ESPN. But then they also have the FA Cup, Champions League, Bundesliga, World Cup through 2026. So what went into that decision for you? Why did you choose to go to the worldwide leader? I think you, you have to look at it from a personal standpoint. And for me, I just was offered a, a really good opportunity at ESPN to, um, you know, not only do MLS and U.S. soccer games sideline, but uh, I like that they really, really want to commit to doing more with soccer on a, so many different platforms, whether it's a sports center, some of their shows it's digitally. It's like they want to cover everything and, and they want to do features and a lot of stories and, and, and everything even beyond the game um, that you see. 
And I just felt that what they're offering was something that maybe was maybe wasn't really there for me at FS1 or even just just at that moment. You kind of have to weigh a lot of different things and and uh, just they they want to do a lot more with it. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of that comes from not having um, as many rights as Fox. And so, yeah, people obviously kind of were like, oh, you're going there. And then, you know, it's tough to leave Fox. I love those guys so much. I've created so many great relationships and friendships. Um, but as I say, like, we're all trying to do the same thing. I said this to the guys when I left, like, we're all trying to make soccer big in this country and like, we have to work together on it. But at the same time, like, I'm really looking forward to kind of doing it in a different way right now. Mm -hmm. Um, the last two years have been great, but sometimes you have to see where you can get the most challenge and and be challenged and and kind of do something different. And, um, ESPN is offering that. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's the case. I'm, I'm guessing since you mentioned that your background was what your degrees were in uh, what gym and drama, that you don't have much when it comes to broadcast negotiations. But I am curious uh, if you think part of that plan for ESPN involves uh, maybe pursuing other rights, other leagues, or maybe going back after, say, like the Premier League or the Bundesliga. Or do you think right now it is just going to be uh, broader coverage in terms of the features that you mentioned, more on Sports Center, uh, things like that? I think they'll definitely, I mean, they. John Skipper, the president of ESPN, is a huge soccer fan. There's a lot of big fans of the sport in at, at executive levels there, and I assume they would want to go for different rights going forward. I obviously don't know anything about that, but um, yeah, just uh, I, I like the enthusiasm, the excitement, the dedication to covering soccer, not just a game, but covering it every day of the week, regardless. And so I wanted to be doing that more so than just the 90 minutes every Sunday, gotcha. doing things every single day. Um, and and I really have always, you know, I'm a reporter, I'm an anchor, I'm a news person, and I always have liked ESPN's commitment mm-hmm. towards news and information. So, um, you know, I haven't tech, technically started there yet, but I'm starting doing some stuff soon, and uh, I couldn't be more excited. And I'm trading Alexi Lawless for Taylor Twelman, so we'll have to see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it'll work out fine. Uh, I'm, sh- I'm yeah. sure you'll be able to still uh, still be in communication with both of them, I, I would venture yeah. to guess. Um, my final question for you then, uh, so you said you haven't quite started yet with ESPN. So what what is next for you uh, uh, with the, you know, the January camp coming up and then obviously the March World Cup qualifiers? Uh, what is next for you on the soccer landscape? And obviously MLS coming uh- back. Yeah, we're we're really gearing up for MLS, which is incredible how quickly it is approaching. Um, you know, just going over stuff from last year and figuring out how to make the product better for the upcoming year and and how to make it bigger and and have sort of you know just a a bigger feel every Sunday and, and throughout the days of the week. So I'm still sort of all this stuff is still new to me on how they're doing stuff. So I'm slowly uncovering it every single day, but. The, the best part about covering soccer is that it, it really is year-round. And I tell that to some of my friends who cover football or college football, NFL. You know, they have sometimes like a really long off-season, which you think is, oh, this is great, all this time off, but it's not, you know. And as you know in this business, you take a couple of days off, as mm. I did last week for a wedding, and you are itching to get back to work because that's It's the worst. Sort of, uh, so much stuff happening, always. Wired. Yeah, we're all wired that way. Yeah. So um, it's great. There's always something to do. And, and sometimes it's hard because you can never really turn off. But that's great, too, because you, you get to do something that you're you're so into and passionate about. So, um, yeah, we'll see what what happens this year. There's Confederations Cup. There's Gold Cup. There's a lot of, you know, international events. So um, looking forward to playing a role in those. Well, yeah, obviously you're passionate enough to uh, to talk about it while avoiding getting hit by other uh, drivers. So I'll let you get back to driving, or maybe you've <laughs> arrived by now and, and you're safely there. But either way, thank you, uh, Julie Stewart-Binks, for joining us today. Of course. Thank you for having me.